Ash Upson, is an unsung hero of the American West. He's not the sort of hero who carried a gun or committed the same daring deeds of Pat Garrett or Billy the Kid. As far as we know, he didn't even fire a shot during the entirety of the Lincoln County War. But Ash is a hero nonetheless, whose weapon was the pen, his heroic deed being the preservation of our history during a time when people took it for granted. While it's true that Ash Upson has gone down in infamy to a degree for concocting fictitious tales in an authentic life of Billy the Kid, which he ghostwrote for Pat Garrett, he preserved a great deal of history via newspaper articles and letters to his family back east. Through these, Ash left behind a wealth of information for modern-day historians. It seemed that every book had a different vignette featuring Ash, and every author had their own opinion of the man. Author Tom Sheridan described him aptly as the quintessential drunken Western journalist in his book The Bitter River, reminiscent of the newspaper editor Dutton Peabody in the great Western movie The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. New Mexico magazine writer Doris Gregory wrote of Upson in an article on Seven Rivers, New Mexico, that those who knew Upson were never surprised by anything that he did. Author Fraser Hunt said of him in Tragic Days of Billy the Kid, he was an amiable near genius, a scraggly, slender, broken-nosed man in his fifties who made it his business never to drink, except when he was alone or with somebody. Surprisingly, until last year, no one had ever written a biography of Upson's life until Roswell historian and author John LeMay published The Man Who Invented Billy the Kid, The Authentic Life of Ash Upson. Of Upson, New Mexico historian Maurice Fulton once said, If materials were more abundant, a fascinating biography might be written of this unique and gifted character who became associated with the Southwest. Since Fulton never followed through with his threat to do so, John LeMay decided to take up the honor. And what a life Upson had. If Ash's bold claims are to be believed, he buddied around New York with Edgar Allan Poe in the 1840s, tutored the children of Brigham Young, was appointed Adjutant General of New Mexico Territory by Governor Robert Mitchell in 1869, and boarded in Silver City with Catherine Antrim and her two sons, one of whom grew to young manhood and became Billy the Kid. Like Billy the Kid, we don't know a great deal about Ash's early days back east compared to when he came west in the 1870s. What we do know is that Ash was born on November 23, 1828, under the full name of Marshall Ashman Upson. Subsequently, November 23rd was the birthday that Ash gave to the kid in the book Authentic Life. Like the kid, there is some debate as to where Ash was born. Many sources, including Ash himself, claim he was born in South Carolina, though the evidence seems to point more conclusively to Walcott, Connecticut. Ash left home at a young age due to what he said was a difficult relationship with his father, though he never elaborated on the subject. All we know is that he left and landed in New York, where he began his lifelong adventure as a journeyman reporter. In New York, he wrote for the New York Herald, and upon departing, went on to write for many other papers, such as the Cincinnati Inquirer. In addition to working at the papers, he was also getting into various brawls. In 1862, his left eyebrow was split open. In 1864, his nose got smashed in at the Dirty Woman's Ranch in the Rockies. And in 1867, he was shot through the cheek and chest with a Smith & Wesson pocket pistol. In a letter to his beloved niece, who he nicknamed Hurricane, he elaborated, I was, as you have already heard, the ugliest in appearance, underlined, in the family, and I want to tell you how much I have improved. I fear you will be sadly disappointed when you see me. I had my nose smashed at what is called the Dirty Woman's Ranch in South Pass of the Rocky Mountains, a hundred miles from Salt Lake City in 1864. 
It is flatter than ever, though the bones were not broken, and in doctoring it myself I left the marks of my lack of skill. Eight years ago I had my left eyebrow split open, and the scars show very plainly. The other eyebrow has been scarred a long time. So is my forehead, chin, and now, two and a half years ago, I was shot in the left cheek and in the breast with a small Smith & Wesson pocket pistol. Neither ball penetrated or fractured the bone, but left an ugly scar on my cheek. Both hands are somewhat scarred and broken up by contact with hard substances. It is almost impossible for one to travel as I have done without having trouble occasionally, especially to one with an impulsive temper. With the rough, ignorant, half-civilized denizens of the mountains and plains, there is no other course but a fearless, independent one. Never to seek a quarrel, but once in combat in such a manner that your antagonist will think twice before he renews the quarrel. I am proud to boast that I have thousands of friends from the Mississippi to the Pacific. You could hardly enter a town up on the border, but you will find someone who knows Ash Upson, and I hardly think you will find three who will speak ill of me. And if a person was hunting me for trouble... He might be advised that Ash was a good man to let alone. I merely write this much about myself, that you may understand something of my life and of the charm which keeps me here, and also that you may not expect when you meet me to see me looking as I did when I last left home. I look old. I am past forty-one. I am disfigured. And don't look pretty worth a cent. Though this letter was written in 1870, Ash did not make it back home to Connecticut until 23 years later. In the late 1860s, Ash traveled westward until he made it to New Mexico, and there he remained until he moved to Evaldi in 1892. Sometime in the early 1870s, Upson may or may not have been a boarder at Catherine Antrim's boarding house in Silver City, where he could have met a young Henry Antrim, one day to become William H. Bonney, alias Billy the Kid. For certain, Upson did meet Bonney in Roswell, the small hamlet which Upson had a hand in protecting during the Lincoln County War and growing afterwards. At this same time, Upson effectively became Pat Garrett's sidekick and the eloquent chronicler of Lincoln County all at once. Upson all but invented the popular image of Billy the Kid when he ghostwrote Garrett's The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid in late 1881. Ash was also involved in the irrigation of the Pecos Valley before he followed Garrett to Uvalde, Texas. Ash was something of a jack-of-all-trades. He was a land surveyor, a notary public, a real estate agent, postmaster, and even a justice of the peace for a time. When Ash settled in New Mexico in the early 1870s, he began the Las Vegas Mail, which would eventually become the Las Vegas Gazette when it was purchased by the next publisher. In late 1871, Ash was the lone Anglo on a small wagon train to Fort Stanton, where he and a friend planned to start a mercantile business. Instead, his friend opened a bar, which Upson had no interest in running despite being a notorious alcoholic. Ash next connected with Robert Casey and lived at his ranch, where he became the area schoolteacher. My pupils are all very good in behavior, except for the larger growth, he wrote in a letter to relatives, referring to grown men, among them Lincoln Sheriff Ham Mills, a six-footer who has killed three men and innumerable Indians in his time. Among the children he taught was Lily Casey, who would grow up to fondly remember Upson in her classic autobiography, My Girlhood Among Outlaws. She said of him, A better teacher, I am sure, never lived. When Robert Casey was assassinated by William Wilson, Ash was present for and wrote a newspaper account of the notorious double hanging of Wilson, who wasn't killed the first time he was strung from the gallows. This article was a precursor of things to come. 
for when Upson later found himself in Roswell surveying for cattleman John Chisholm, he became a de facto war correspondent of sorts in the Lincoln County War. During the war, Upson served as postmaster of Roswell and actually managed to keep the peace there by threatening to shut the office down if violence occurred in his vicinity. As both sides needed their mail, this ploy worked, and the peace was kept in Roswell. At some unknown point in history, Upson met the new sheriff-elect Patrick F. Garrett in 1879. Though most assume Roswell Patriarch Captain J.C. Lee, for whom Lee County is named, introduced the duo, it's possible Upson was part of a riding party with Garrett. Local legend claims Garrett hunted down a party of renegade Comanche who had stolen some horses late in 1879. A November 2, 1879 letter by Upson states, we followed a party of Indians over on the Llano Estacado the other day, whipped them, killed four Indians, got back thirteen head of horses they had stolen. Upson and Garrett became fast friends, and after Garrett gunned down Billy the Kid at Fort Sumner, he invited Upson to come and live at the Garrett Ranch in August of 1881. When Garrett became incensed at claims that he had killed Bonnie unfairly, he partnered with Upson to write a book on the topic. The result was the notoriously mistitled The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, rife with myths and tall tales, even though both men had known the kid personally. After the book's failure to sell many copies, Upson lamented to his sister in May of 1882 that the book has been bungled in the publication. The Santa Fe publishers took five months to do a month's job and then made a poor one. Pat F. Garrett, who killed the kid, and whose name appears as the author of this work, although I wrote every word of it, as it would make it sell, insisted on taking it to Santa Fe and was swindled badly in his contract. Despite the book's original failure, Upson had dreams of writing a follow-up on the Lincoln County War. Supposedly, Ash kept these writings in a small trunk he carried with him everywhere up until his death in Uvalde, where he had moved with Garrett in 1892. Garrett and his family had moved to Uvalde due to his losing a recent election in Chavez County, New Mexico, where his home, Roswell, was the county seat. Though Ash always planned to go with the Garretts, for a time he stayed in Roswell to wrap up their various affairs. While in Roswell, Ash received letters from nine-year-old Ida Garrett stating that while she and her mother preferred their old home, her papa was doing well in Uvalde with horse racing. Finally, in January 1892, the Garrett Ranch, four miles east of Roswell, was sold and Upson was free to join Garrett in Uvalde. The June 3rd edition of the Roswell Record told of Upson leaving the area. M. A. Upson, one of the oldest timers in the Pecos Valley and whose reminiscences have interested many readers in the record, will leave on the stage tomorrow en route to Eddie to meet Pat F. Garrett, with whom he will go to Uvalde. Uncle Ash will be missed by the printer when he needs copy, by the searcher after early historical dates referring to the Pecos Valley, by the lover of a good joke and by the pretty schoolgirl distressed because she cannot solve an arithmetical problem. He has promised the record to continue his contributions with reference to the early history of the Pecos Valley. We wish him bon voyage and a speedy return. Among the few details we can glean of Ash's new life in Uvalde, several come from a letter he wrote to his sister. Uvalde, Texas, August 5, 1892 Dear Sister M., forgive my long silence. I intended to come here to Mr. Garrett's in May, and thought I would delay writing until I reached here. Since I have been in Ovalde, I have been very busy. Garrett has built me a beautiful office with bedroom attached. I don't think we can start the big canal for irrigation before the middle of winter. Then I shall be busy and with a good salary." Garrett has invested a good deal of money here, not only in real estate, but in fine horse stock. 
The delay in canal business swamped him for ready means, and I loaned him my money until September, when I expected to go home. Money is very scarce here, and he, Pat, can only raise it by mortgage. He will be easy in money matters in November. I am very busy with builders, painters, and correspondents about the proposed canal, but nothing will prevent my trip when it is necessary. In 1893, Upson took a trip to visit his dying mother back east, and along the way got into a few drunken tears and even ended up in jail. When he failed to return to Uvalde, Word spread to New Mexico, where the Roswell Register fantastically reported, it is feared that he now lies in an unknown grave, in a strange land, and that his fate may never be known. Ash would have surely been pleased at the sensational attention he received, just as we hope he is today with this ceremony. Ash didn't last long once he returned to Uvalde, as he had contracted influenza. Garrett wrote of the difficulty he was having with Upson to his nephew, Frank Downs. Your letter at hand several days ago. I have not seen the one Uncle Ash got from you, but asked him to let me see it. He said, get it, and read part of it to me. The old man is in bad shape, or at least he seems to think so. He will not try to do anything. I can't get him to take any interest of any kind of work. I think the worst trouble with him now is the lack of energy. If you could get him up there with you, he might take hold and do something. The truth is, I am not able to keep him. I have two in my family now that is helpless. My boy Poe is paralyzed, and as you know, I have one blind child. I think it is too much to expect me to support Uncle Ash." Ash Upson passed away on October 6, 1894, at Garrett Ranch, west of Uvalde. Just as Garrett would one day have himself, Upson's funeral was a non-religious one. In a letter to Ash's sister, Garrett explained, William A.K. West, an atheist, officiated at his grave. Like his pal Garrett, Upson was an agnostic. This fact he seemed to have hidden from his students at the Casey Ranch in Ruidoso, where he taught during the early 1870s. He once wrote in a letter to his niece, You ought to hear the devotions in my school. I have not heard a prayer for two or three years. But don't tell anybody that. How they would be shocked, don't you think? An early-day Roswell resident, James Oliver Carper, wrote this recollection of Upson and his father in the late 1880s. Uncle Ash Upson was one of the first men I knew in Roswell. We lived as close neighbors, and I remember the long and sometimes heated arguments he and Dad had over religion. Ash was an infidel, and Dad was a church man, and any time they met they went at it, hammer and tongs. Unfortunately, after Ash's funeral, his grave was all but forgotten. Lucius Dills, a friend in Roswell, recalled someone telling him that a granite marker had been placed over the grave site. He stated, Knowing Garrett as only a few really knew him, I am prepared to believe that such was done. In October 1939, Marvin Hunter, editor of the Frontier Times and a friend, went to the city clerk in Uvalde to try and find out which unmarked grave was Upson's. Unfortunately, no number was found. Instead, only the entry, one grave purchased by P.F. Garrett for M.A. Upson. Taylor wrote to Fulton, I almost wept when I saw the bare space, covered with gravel and sand, with a few dyspeptic springs of grass. We, Team Upson, have now done our best to correct this unfortunate situation. Even though many of the cemetery records were destroyed, we were able to locate the survey which listed the plots owned by Pat Garrett. Today you see the beautiful and appropriate marker that now graces Ash Upson's grave. Though Upson may have only been a supporting character in the drama of the American West, he is no less as mythic as his counterparts, Pat Garrett, John Chisholm, and Billy the Kid. <laughs>